Okay, nicely. Just out of considerations of time, do you think there's going to be a few more trickling, or should I just make it start? Um, we have a vain hope of this room being full. It's probably not going to happen, so. Okay, I'll, I'll make it start. The next, the next week we can, can't we? We're going to try it. Yeah. Okay. So the next talk is called Finding His Way, and the subtitle being Martin Luther King and the Paradox of Nonviolence, because actually. I don't think that most people really understand what nonviolence is in practical or in philosophical terms. So basically this is going to be an exploration of how nonviolent tactics work. Now as I was saying in the previous talk, over the course of the Montgomery bus boycott, King had received national and international recognition because of his advocacy of nonviolence. Nonviolence has been one of the things that the press really picked up on. And the position that he outlined then was very much framed by his Christian ministry. And it also played a role in contrast to the escalating levels of segregationist violence. The national press, for example, first put King on the front pages after his home was bombed and he urged the crowd that gathered to love their enemies. Now at the same time, King's non-violent stance was linked to the example of Mohandas K. Gandhi, who garnered a global reputation through his philosophy of non-violence, notably in relation to the Indian independence movement, and Gandhi was himself, of course, assassinated in 1948, and you've got to remember that you know 1955 is not that long ago from 48. He's still kind of a figure of some prominence. Gandhi's ideas were already circulating in America in the 30s through groups like A.J. Must's Fellowship of Reconciliation. And Must was also involved in the um, growth of American trade unionism in the 30s and 40s. African Americans were already experimenting with Gandhian techniques with two young radicals, James Farmer and Bayard Rustin, forming the Congress of Racial Equality in 1942 in Chicago. The most prominent black labor leader of the war period, A. Philip Randolph, had used what were essentially nonviolent techniques in the March on Washington movement uh, in 1940 to extract concessions from Roosevelt on black employment in defense industries. And Randolph continued to use it in his campaigns to desegregate the armed forces and to promote fair employment practices. This Congress of Racial Equality that I was talking about had tried to dramatize the injustice of segregation on the interstate bus system with something called the Journey of Reconciliation in 1947, and Bayard Rustin had been one of the riders. So although Gandhi was often linked to King, King was neither the first to invoke nonviolence, nor the most experienced or knowledgeable about Gandhi and nonviolence when Rustin, Rustin went to visit him in Montgomery in 1956. When Rustin went to sit down in King's living room, he almost sat on a loaded gun. Uh, and he had to explain to King that if he wished to be a nonviolent leader in the style of Gandhi, he'd have to project an image that went beyond nonviolence as a tactic, but actually embraced it as a way of life. So, one of the first things that I want to explain is that Gandhi's nonviolence was not identical to King's. And that that isn't a criticism. King should instead be praised for adapting nonviolence to the African American cause and the American context. Gandhi's nonviolence is often dramatized by the image of Gandhi himself on the Salt March or undertaking a hunger strike. King's nonviolence, when it is pictured, is often pictured with Martin Luther King addressing the crowd. 
So there is this sense that somehow King is more an exponent, uh, an advocate of nonviolence, whereas Gandhi is a practitioner of nonviolence. Of course, Gandhi was himself a product of many international influences. He trained as a lawyer in London, and he acknowledged the influence of European figures such as Leo Tolstoy. He developed his philosophy of nonviolence as a lawyer defending Indian minority interests in South Africa. There, he saw white colonial rule imposing its will by force and by exploiting the divisions within the country to force accommodation and compromise. Sometimes the colonial authorities appeared to be the neutral arbiter of conflicting interest groups. So what Gandhi took to be his breakthrough discovery about nonviolence in South Africa was that if you want to pursue truth and justice, you must embrace conflict. Conflict could bring you closer to the truth, but accommodation and compromise never would. So this is the opening part of the paradox of nonviolence. It recognizes that conflict is a good thing. Once you realize that Gandhi believed that conflict was a good thing, and that every single day you should be looking for those moments of conflict, you realize he must have been hell to live with. <laughs> so, Gandhi in South Africa is a really quite an ambivalent figure, because on the one hand, as an attorney, he is representing his Indian clients, and is protecting their interests. And at the same time, he's unsure as to what his position is in relation to imperial authorities. There are moments when Gandhi comes close to courting the colonial authorities against the native peoples. It's only after he makes this breakthrough and realizes that accommodation and compromise, arbitration, are all flawed ways of proceeding, that he discovers the full radicalness of nonviolence. King did not realize the revolutionary implications of nonviolence until much later than Montgomery. He initially felt that it provided a framework for compromise and accommodation. Looking at his career from 1955 to 1965, one can detect that his breakthrough comes sometime in 1963. At that point, he starts to emphasize the need for creative tension as a springboard for negotiation that must then lead to the next wave of creative tension. Over the next two years, between 63 and 65, his protests do help to extract important reforms. But by 1966, he's already well aware that these steps, in reality, constitute another compromise and accommodation that can never really resolve the conflict. So more, more protests will be essential. So I think we misunderstand nonviolence. I think the common view of nonviolence is just that it is refusing to be violent. And in that sense, it's seen as being conciliatory, passive, and far less radical than approaches that say, by whatever means necessary, we are prepared to fight for what we believe to be right. What you get with Gandhi, and this idea that conflict is good, is that nonviolence is all about action, action against injustice. And the basic imperative is that every injustice demands action rather than acceptance in order to move closer to an ideal truth. Now again, I have to concede that this is Gandhi's writing. It's what he ideally says. 
And again, in practice, he often moves closer to compromise than he does always to the kind of radical anarchism that his nonviolent position might uh, lead him to. So when King defended the Montgomery bus boycott in the language of Christianity by speaking of the need to love one's enemies and of the redemptive character of suffering, he seemed to suggest it was just about African-American endurance and that somehow God would come on their side and make things right. This gave the impression that nonviolence was almost entirely defined by what it was not. People got the impression that the essence of nonviolence was about being nice, being conciliatory, almost pleading with bad people to stop being bad. But like Gandhi, King came to see that the key part of nonviolence was action. You were not passive and you were not prepared to accept injustice. The term used at the time of nonviolent direct action became popular because it contrasted with the slow, formal processes of getting rights through lawsuits and political lobbying, and instead went for the immediate impact of protesting directly against the injustices that were visible and tangible every day. So King had talked about loving your enemies and confronting them with the true nature of their oppression. He seemed to suggest that somehow nonviolence was a kind of missionary exercise in which you touched the better side of a person's nature and they suddenly realized they were doing the wrong thing and stopped doing it. But at the same time, the boycotts that he began with didn't just have a moral side to them. They had a coercive, compelling side as well. The boycott reflected a more secular tradition of consumer protest. During the Depression of the 30s, African Americans had run what they called Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaigns, targeting businesses that relied on African American customers but failed to hire African American staff. The bus boycott was in that tradition because its leaders realized that most of the people who rode the buses were African Americans and if they didn't ride the buses, the company's profits would nosedive. One reason why King's moral claims for the protest were important at the outset was that segregationists were using the same tactics of economic pressure. They were using economic intimidation against anyone black or white who sympathized with bus, these, uh, with the school desegregation. So these members of the Citizens Council were white businessmen and if you were in favor of school desegregation they would call in your loans, they would refuse you loans, they wouldn't supply your businesses, they would sack you from your job. Now if compared to the Ku Klux Klan, that's non-violent. So it was important for King to make his boycott appear different, which is why he emphasizes the moral dimensions of his nonviolence. King's nonviolence had another pragmatic edge to it at this stage, because it was designed to take the edge off a rising tide of white violence that hit the national headlines through the brutal murder of Emmett Till in the summer of 1955. A Chicago teenager murdered while visiting relatives in Mississippi. One enduring part of King's pragmatic commitment to nonviolence was his perception that if African Americans used violence to protest, the violence rather than the underlying grievance would dominate the story in the newspapers. He was also convinced that if mobilizing as many people as possible was essential to the success of the protest, then in practice fewer people were willing to risk everything by taking up guns than those who were ready to protest peacefully. So underneath the kind of moral appeal and the spiritual appeal 
of nonviolence being the right thing to do uh, to love your enemies. There is this more calculated view that we've got some leverage through the boycott system, we are going to look better in the eyes of the press and get our message out there, and we're going to give less scope for this white violence to go to yet another level and the spiral to continue. King's public profile, by the um, end of 1956 into 57, encouraged Bayard Rustin and others to say, okay, let's form an organization to promote nonviolence as a strategy for dealing with uh, segregation in the South. But as I mentioned in the other talk, the SCLC was not an immediate success. When it tried to export the boycott tactic, the authorities respond by closing down the buses, an outcome that made everyday life more difficult for African Americans who were more reliant on the buses than with the whites. When he tried to refocus on school desegregation, there was little enthusiasm since it quickly became apparent that token desegregation might just provide an excuse for further reducing resources to black schools and might even jeopardize jobs held by black teachers. When he switched to voter registration, he antagonized existing organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, who felt there really wasn't a need for another organization. He should be pouring his efforts into their organization to make it stronger. So as he's recuperating from the knife attack in 1958, SCLC is floundering. Its programs are weak, its finances and management are weak, and the experienced activist Ella Baker is being called back in to keep the thing afloat. What she finds is that King and the other preachers on the board are long on words and slow on action. At the end of 1959, when King announced that he was leaving Dexter to accept a co-pastor role in his father's church in Atlanta, it seemed very much as if he'd lost his way. And his public profile was based on a celebrity status rather than any current actions. And already people were keeping score on his failures. The MIA had lapsed back into backbiting and recrimination. The crusade for citizenship, the voter registration campaign, had flopped. The workshops on nonviolence seemed to produce lots of talk, but very little in the way of fresh protest. Independent of King, a new wave of nonviolent protest was taking shape. It began, ironically in a way, among NAACP youth councils in border states like Oklahoma, but it really sprang to life in February 1960 due to a fairly spontaneous protest by four male students in Greensboro, North Carolina, who chose to sit in at the lunch counter of the Woolworths department store. They returned the next day with more colleagues, and the sit-in protest spread first to other college towns in North Carolina, and then across the South, with Northern sympathizers picketing the chain stores uh, like Woolworths that operated nationally. Far more than the bus boycotts, the sit-ins embodied the new character of non-violent direct action and they represented a fresh development that occurred independent of King, and he had to learn from them. The boycotts had worked through economic leverage, applying pressure by turning off the flow of money to the business targeted. In essence, boycotts saw the oppressed group resist oppression by absenting themselves from the site of mistreatment. They wouldn't ride the bus until they were treated with dignity. And this illustrates how the sit-ins were different. They required the oppressed to occupy the site of mistreatment and demand that the behavior of the oppressor change. By putting their bodies on the line, the protesters, in one sense, called the oppressor's bluff by demanding service or arrest. This was even clearer in the 1961 Freedom Rides. In many areas of the South, segregation was a part of everyday life because people complied with it. 
And the fear of enforcement and of vigilante justice, just the fear of it, was sufficient to maintain the system. The, sit the sit-ins and the freedom rides signaled that segregation was now going to be overtly contested and so it would have to be enforced. And so the cost of maintaining it was going to increase. The similarities between the bus boycott and the sit-ins lay in the community response to the segregationist reaction. For Bayard Rustin, one of the most important moments in the Montgomery bus boycott was when the state decided to indict 89 boycott leaders with conspiracy. He persuaded all the 89 of them to go voluntarily to the police station and thus signaled to the community and to their opposition that they were no longer afraid of what the authorities might do to them. As a parallel, over the course of 1960 and 1961, it was decided that wherever possible, sit-in protesters and freedom riders would not agree to post bail, but would instead or pay fines, they would just insist on going to jail. This jail not bail approach signaled that the protesters were not intimidated. More practically, it blocked the effectiveness of the authorities trying to boost the bail level to such exorbitant amounts that they bankrupted the movement. Instead, they had to pay the cost of keeping the protesters in jail. It simultaneously generated publicity that helped fundraising efforts in the North and opened up the possibility that if enough people protested, you could fill all the jails and create a genuine crisis of law enforcement. The willingness of young student protesters to go to jail reflected the reality that they had fewer obligations. They didn't have full-time jobs, they didn't have families to support, they didn't have mortgages to pay. All those things made going to jail for adults a much more difficult option to take. For King, for instance, there was the reality that most of the money that came to SDLC relied on his personal appearances and speeches. Within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was founded after the sit-ins, Getting arrested and going to jail became such a badge of honour that your status in the organisation was linked to how often you'd gone to jail. <laughs> and this behaviour bewildered external advisers. Newly appointed Attorney General Bobby Kennedy was bewildered by the decision of the Freedom Riders to stay in jail in Mississippi and angered by the flow of fresh volunteers. He complained they were embarrassing his brother, the president, in the eyes of the world. Kennedy's concern that nonviolent protests generated negative publicity for the United States was done in the context of the Cold War. And it revealed another important element of nonviolence, the use of the media. It's always important for a protest movement to get its message out to make the public aware of its grievances. This public relations exercise has to be seen in a contest to sway public opinion. If the authorities, and we see this every, you know, almost every week, but certainly frequently enough, if the authorities can portray protesters negatively, they have much greater freedom to take tough measures to break up the protests. But if the protesters are viewed sympathetically, public opinion can induce politicians to make concessions. In this respect, nonviolence was important because it gave African American demands greater legitimacy and made harsh actions by whites the centre of the story. Although Martin Luther King spoke out in support of the sit-ins during 1960 and was eventually jailed for participating in one in Atlanta. He was far from the forefront, despite the media's continuing fascination with him. On May the 13th, 1961, when the Freedom Riders visited Atlanta, he hosted them and gave them contact names in Alabama, but he warned them that they were almost certain to face extreme violence there. Within 48 hours, one bus had been firebombed, and you see the picture there that went around the world. 
and the other had been greeted by an angry mob in Birmingham that beat the riders as they got off the bus. And this is a young white volunteer called Jim Swerve. When King visited Montgomery to rally support when the Freedom Riders faced violence there, he was besieged in the First Baptist Church and pleaded over the phone with Bobby Kennedy to send aid to protect the people inside. Now, while this foreshadowed the way in which the Kennedy administration would reluctantly be drawn into supporting the civil rights movement, it also shows that at this stage, King was not as ruthless in exploiting situations as he later became. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had been formed out of the sit-in wave of 1960, and it was a consortium of local groups notably one from Nashville, Tennessee, that had been trained in nonviolence by a young minister, you've got his mugshot bottom left there, James Lawson, who had lived in India to study Gandhian techniques firsthand. Lawson had eclipsed King at the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee's founding conference. Everybody thought that Lawson's speech was the real one to listen to. Martin was a bit dull. Um, and Lawson's disciples were energized by his call to create a non-violent army to take the fight into the south. One of those disciples, the woman at the front on the top picture there, is Diane Nash. And she's the one who decides that even though the buses have been firebombed, even though the violence has occurred, they must continue, despite the escalating violence. When the Freedom Riders invite King to join them on the ride from Montgomery to Jackson, he says no. When they press him, he said rather pompously that he had the right to choose the time and the place of his Golgotha, referring to the site of Christ's crucifixion. From then on, some of the SNCC people referred to King sarcastically as the Lord, because clearly he thought he was Christ reborn. King's influence with the SNCC had already been weakened by the fact that Ella Baker had decided that the students shouldn't become part of SCLC, which is what some of his lieutenants wanted, but should be independent. And she talked to them about not trusting charismatic leaders with feet of clay, and everybody knew who she was talking about. After King failed to go on the Freedom Rides, Robert Williams, a North Carolina civil rights leader, sent him a harshly worded telegram that called him, and I quote, a phony. The two had clashed earlier when Williams had urged African Americans to organize armed self-defense groups. Gandhi, Williams now pointed out, had always been in the forefront suffering with his people. Before 1961 had ended, armed clashes in Williams' hometown of Monroe had culminated in his being indicted for kidnapping and forced to flee the US via Canada and then to communist Cuba and then to China. King, meantime, had lost even further credibility with the practitioners of radical nonviolence in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He'd accepted an invitation to speak in a small Georgia town, Albany, where SNCC veterans of the Freedom Rides had expanded voter registration efforts and begun to test whether the city was actually desegregating its bus and rail terminals. Several high school students had been arrested and the community rallied round to defend them. When King spoke at a local church, he was spontaneously invited to lead a march the next morning. He complained he even hadn't brought his toothbrush with him. It was such a surprise to be asked to do this. And quickly, he found himself in jail. Conscious of his need to match Snick's level of commitment, he announced he would not file bail, but would remain there even if it was through the Christmas holidays. This was early December. However, local leaders were duped by the sheriff, Laurie Pritchett, seen here holding his hand up, 
into believing that there would be meaningful negotiations if King left. Having warned those leaders that they really needed to get their promises in writing, King nonetheless agreed to post bail. And then it emerged that the city authorities actually had no intention of giving any concessions. Now what made this episode significant was that the national press portrayed it as a major defeat for King and a major defeat for, for non-violence. It made a big story out of the divisions inside the movement. By late 62, therefore, King's profile was slipping. People were questioning whether non-violence could work. In Albany, it seemed as if a smart sheriff could outmaneuver them simply by not being brutal on camera. It was against this background that King planned to launch a concerted campaign in, Alban in Alabama's industrial city of Birmingham. In planning that campaign, he drew on the lessons of the Albany campaign. He needed a campaign where SCLC, his organization, was more in control, rather than competing with other civil rights groups. And he knew there was a strong SCLC affiliate in Birmingham, headed by a preacher called Fred Shuttlesworth. He also needed a campaign that was likely to grab the headlines and maybe induce the Kennedy administration to intervene. And Birmingham had a notorious police commissioner, Bull Connor, Eugene Theophilus Connor, who had given the Klan the green light to beat up Freedom Riders on arrival two years earlier. So he expected a violent reaction. Finally, King felt that he needed clear targets to ensure that he could leave, claiming some victory, even if the gains were modest. The downtown department stores were so reliant on black customers that they would struggle if they lost African American support. So King targeted them. The campaign got off to a slow start with far fewer volunteers coming forward at the mass meetings. Downtown store owners closed the lunch counters and denied protesters a protest site. Even Bull Connor was behaving cautiously. When King went to jail on April the 12th, Good Friday, it was almost an act of desperation to try to get attention for a flagging campaign. As many of you may know, he, uh, whilst he was in jail, he wrote a famous essay, letter from Birmingham jail, in reply to some local white clergymen, who said that his protests were ill-timed and counterproductive. Rereading that letter, it is striking to see how harshly it comments on the role of white moderates, whose desire for peace and calm makes them an obstacle to justice. He also explains, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. So it's worth noting that this essay circulated widely only months later and so was read in the context of Birmingham's success rather than its imminent failure. The turning point in Birmingham came in early May when King's aide Jim Bevel, who'd been trained by James Lawson in Nashville, persuaded him to let the children march. This gave the protesters hundreds of extra bodies to fill the streets and presented Police Commissioner Connor with a trap that he duly fell into. Unable to arrest all the children because his jail capacity was overflowing, he reverted to his usual brutal tactics and before the watching cameras used police attack dogs and high pressure fire hoses to try to disperse the crowd. The shocking pictures circulated rapidly, nationally and internationally, prompting protests in many other cities, outrage around the world and embarrassment in the White House. <laughs>
However, even though King now had the crisis that he felt was necessary to trigger positive action, he also faced multiple challenges. On the one hand, he had goaded white racists into publicly demonstrating their brutality, but their venom was not easily controlled. In the early hours of May the 12th, bombers dynamited King's fortunately empty hotel room at the Gaston Motel. And in the aftermath, Alabama State Patrolmen, dispatched to the area by the segregationist governor, uh, George Wallace, clashed violently with local people, thus producing some of the first urban racial disturbances in the 60s, a decade that would be dominated by them. So King faced increased dangers both directly from white violence and indirectly in the sense that African-American retaliation could provide the excuse for an official clampdown or could lead the media to report mainly the violence rather than the reasons behind it. By 1963, King recognized that it was extraordinarily difficult to maintain nonviolent discipline for a prolonged period, especially when the other side was likely to escalate the violence. Consequently, he was relatively sympathetic to Kennedy's efforts to mediate the local agreement and the Birmingham campaign. At the same time, the surge of racial disturbances across the country maintained the pressure on Kennedy to announce further action. On June the 11th, Kennedy announced he was sending a comprehensive civil rights bill to Congress which would require the desegregation of all public accommodations as well as other reforms. So this pattern in Birmingham, King's use of nonviolent tactics to goad segregationists into a public display of brutality, which then produces a broader public reaction that requires positive government intervention has been seen as a model that he used again two years later in Selma to secure the Voting Rights Act of 1965. At the heart of this method, people feel there is an unsettling paradox. Put simply, nonviolence seems to need <coughs> to provoke violence in order to work. So I've taken the story of Martin Luther King essentially up to the moment for which he is now largely remembered, the August 1963 I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington. <coughs> In memory, this is a triumphant moment that seems to symbolize how King became an all-American hero. But I want you to understand that in an important way, that is a lie. The man who spoke at the Lincoln Memorial was already under covert surveillance from the federal government. The FBI chief, J. Edgar Hoover, hated Martin Luther King and told the president and all his subordinates that King was, and I quote, no good in any way. As we've already seen, inside the civil <coughs> freedom struggle, there were plenty of critical voices raised against King, with some people saying, that he was good at talking about nonviolence, but left the dangerous practice of it to other people. As Robert Williams had said, after hearing that King had not gone on the freedom rides, compared to Gandhi, who sometimes fasted to the point of death during his campaigns, King was a phony. In the summer of 1963, <coughs> one of King's most caustic critics was the Nation of Islam's charismatic spokesman, Malcolm X who had greeted the spectacle of the children being attacked in Birmingham by declaring, real men don't put their children on the firing line. Malcolm's analysis of the <coughs> campaign and the summer march on Washington was acerbic and presented King as a Kennedy collaborator, in effect a counter-revolutionary. Concessions in Malcolm's view had only come once African Americans in Birmingham had shown that they would fight back. And Kennedy had in effect paid King to calm the tensions down. 
and stall the black revolution. It's to that aspect of Martin's career to this, and his role in the pursuit of black power that I will turn next Sunday. Thank you. Questions? Are we all ready for a non-violent protest? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? You had questions, by the way. It, yeah, I, I, I'm still baffled by the fact that uh, right now, somewhere in Montgomery, Alabama, a statue of Gandhi is... And it's... It is kind of bringing him into negative criticism. I am of the view that Gandhi's passive resistance was not sufficiently researched by the people who were close to Martin Luther King. And because of the... Uh, so, all right. India is a, is a multiracial and multicultural gathering of people. And we know that up to 70% of the people in India are of African origin. And they have had their struggles. It's, I was watching a documentary last week which is said categorically. Gandhi. As Hindu, he has addressed problems of the Hindu ranks. Uh, he has always been addressing problems of them. But very little have been said about the untouchables, those people they call sudras. Mm. And he has never been printed by any press or, or reported trying in any way, shape, or form to address the problems of the Africans who live in India. And on that basis, we've come perilously close to a question which there is no answer. Why? Why not? Why did Gandhi not do enough to address those no. tensions inside India? Y yes. Um, I mean, I think there, there is an irony in what you say, given that Gandhi is ultimately murdered by a Hindu nationalist for not being sufficiently defensive of Hinduism as the true core of Indian identity. So he's actually killed by people who think that he isn't doing enough to defend their exclusiveness as the Hindu people. He does do some efforts to address the question of un untouchability. He may well not do enough. But tactically, what he is mainly concerned about in the 30s is seeing ways in which he can show Indians that they can, in fact, overthrow the British Raj, that they need not just accept it as as inevitable as the sun rising, that realistically, if they don't cooperate with the government of India, it will fall. Then, in the 40s, he's trying, at the end of his life, to wrestle with the issues of partition. And at that point, he's dealing with the fact that Hindu nationalists want to ethnically purge India of their Muslim mi minorities. So, you can always find a reason why leaders don't address all the problems that there are. I think what King takes from Gandhi in 1963 is this message that actually you should not be afraid of conflict. You should not try to contain grievances in such a form as to make it easy to accommodate and compromise on them. He wants to reach a point of such crisis that you've got to do something about it. Now, what you can criticise him for, and what some people do, I mean, James Foreman, who is uh, 
executive director of SNCC in his memoir writes about Martin Luther King in the motel suite before it's blown up um, sitting in his silk pajamas eating a good steak whilst the children are down at the fairground in the pouring rain without any shelter facing another night of captivity and he tells that story in order to dramatize that King is a man who talks the talk but doesn't actually do what he's asking his followers to do. King has already gone to jail. There are other kinds of notions as to what the roles are of different elements within a social movement. But he is beginning to perceive that this is not going to be something that will be changed by quiet negotiation and reasonableness. And in that sense, he is becoming like Gandhi, who the British regarded as somebody who was unreasonable and not prepared to go along with them as they gradually, over time, would prepare India for self-rule, maybe not in the 20th century, maybe sometime in the 21st, but they would do it gradually and reasonably. King and Gandhi believed that there are limits to reason and there are moments when conflict is good. That, I think, is not how he's remembered as a non-violent protester. Yeah. I don't know. I was just wondering if, at any point um, in the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King ever considered or flirted with, if you like, the idea of, um, or the effectiveness of violence or self-defense as a means to achieving um, his, his goal of desegregation in the United States. At the very start, I mean, one of the things that um, is caught in an interview um, in early 1956 during the Montgomery bus boycott is King telling an interviewer that maybe some white people have to die before these um, local authorities will take them seriously. That's the only documented evidence that we have that he is prepared to consider armed struggle. Once he becomes, once the Montgomery bus boycott <coughs> happens and he's found his head of the SCLC, he does embrace nonviolence as a philosophy and as a way of life. So he believes that <coughs> armed struggle creates more problems than it solves. That particularly for African Americans inside the United States, their minority position means that armed struggle is likely to be more costly for them than the benefits will justify. I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about that particular kind of hard-headed calculation in relation to other conflict zones. Supposing Palestinians, since 1948, had meticulously maintained some kind of strategy of non-violence without the use of terrorism, without the use of armed struggle, how much more difficult would it be for Israel to orchestrate the network of support around the globe that allows it to maintain its dominance in that region? In some senses, armed struggle, although you can entirely understand why it happens, can be counterproductive. It can actually position you in relation to potential allies in a profoundly negative way. So King was very persuaded by that. He also believed, as I said in the first lecture, that every single human being you meet is sacred. He really believed that. And so you, even if, even if he's a Gestapo death camp officer, you do not have the right to kill him. You have the right, indeed, you have the duty, according to him, to try to get to the divine within him by treating him with the respect for human rights that is appropriate. Now, what King comes to realize, increasingly, is that that is so hard. That is just so hard to do for any length of time. That even in Birmingham, 
you know, we get the pictures of the of the um, the dogs attacking the students. We now know from some of the SCRC officers that off camera there were bystanders who were not part of the main body of trained nonviolent practitioners giving those dogs the occasional kick up the arse. They were basically goading the dogs. They were phoning in false alarms to make sure that the fire engines had to leave the area so they could get further downtown and stage the demonstration at a point where there were more cameras. They were being absolutely ruthless about the staging of this in Birmingham. There is the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson during the, um, the Selma campaign. It happens during a night march in an adjoining community to Selma, which SCLC officers have authorised because they know that night marches leave the protesters more vulnerable and therefore are more likely to provoke white violence. King believes that the larger strategic goal, like any general in a battle, is going to incur some costs. And what drives people to fury in late 1963, in September 1963, is that four young African-American girls in Sunday school in Birmingham, in 16th Street Baptist Church, are blown to smithereens by a segregationist bomb. And the parents of one of those girls said, their blood is on your hands, Martin Luther King. That's what you have done to us. So it was a difficult road for him to take, this nonviolence. And he felt the responsibility. He felt some of the guilt along the way. But what he consistently argues is that actually... The brutality that you see in that bombing was always there. It wasn't just that moment. It was there in the system of racism. And people were not seeing it. People felt that racism was something they could live with. And the only way in which they would come to realize that it wasn't something they should live with was by having something forced in their faces, like those pictures of violence. Um, thank you for the talk, very, very interesting. Um, one question. Uh, many, many whites participated in the march in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and also many actors from Hollywood and, and celebrities. And, uh, why do you think that happened? I remember when last summer um, yeah, Lewis, Lewis was giving this speech in the Library of Congress, and it was very funny. He said that they want to talk with Kennedy. Well, Lewis is, is the only person alive that, from the organizers of the march. And they want to speak with Kennedy, and Kennedy tried to stop them to do the march, but they did it anyway. But when the day came, they were very surprised because of the amount of people that went there. Many buses from different places eh, from the United States went to Washington, and they thought, Oh my God, look at all, all of these people. We have to do it because they are all here. This is Lewis speaking. So why, why do you think um, they did drag the support from whites and many other Latinos, I think, as well, and many other groups? So. I mean, the March on Washington is an amazingly staged event, and the man I've referred to, I should have had pictures of him up there, Bayard Rustin, was the mastermind behind it. Uh, he had worked with A. Philip Randolph on this idea of a march on Washington. And at this stage in his career, Rustin is very convinced about the possibility of coalition politics. So he wants to persuade a very reluctant Kennedy administration that there is a broad coalition out there that is saying you've got to do something about the denial of basic civil rights to African Americans. So he makes it easier, as easy as possible, 
for organized groups to come. They get money from the trade unions to pay for the buses, so it's free transport down there. They have placards that are already pre-printed, so they don't have to bring them, they get handed to them. They don't have to bring lunch because there's about 270 people making cheese sandwiches. He's organized latrines so that they can definitely go and relieve themselves. He's organized a different sound system because he knows that one of the ways in which people can get bored is if they can't hear what's going on at the, at the, at the national event. So Rustin is going over every single particular to try to ensure that the event will be a success and that it attracts both white and black. Another thing that helps to make it a success is that the segregationists, including um, the leader of the American Nazi party, um, Nelson Rockwell, um, fail. They are trying to organize a counter demonstration to provoke violence on the day and about 10 people show up. They, they are a dismal failure. That helps uh, because Kennedy actually has several battalions of troops in, uh, in neighboring Virginia ready to come and calm things if trouble breaks out. They're absolutely, And that all the judges have had leave counsel so they can run all, all night <laughs> sessions to prosecute people for civil disorder if it's not a peaceful day. So all kinds of contingency plans are made to ensure that it comes off as an event, and it's stage managed in other ways that John, John Lewis would know uh, all about. But the March on Washington, even though it is a great symbolic occasion, is a very poor representation of the civil rights movement. Because the civil rights movement doesn't win victories by having lots of people come together and listen to speeches. It wins victories by saying that we have a way where we can go into the political economy and stage events that cause the thing to stop. By the time the department stores in Birmingham say they want to reach an accord with Martin Luther King, they are losing $200,000 a day. That's pretty persuasive. And if nonviolent direct action is such a spanner in the works, that it says, if you are not going to make concessions on this, we will make sure that things don't function, then you can get change. That's what King comes to believe. So, he believes that if you can put a spanner in the works, then the works will change. He's not about just speech making, he's about action. And that's really what the movement is about as well. It's not about the speeches, it's about the actions. So, so it sort of becomes like a business case for equality rather than... No, I think it's always, it's always a moral case as well. as well. But I think that in order for... Checking, King quotes Frederick Douglass time and time again that power yields nothing without demand. And the demand has to be backed by some degree of coercion. They won't do this because they're good people. They'll do this because it's so much more... It's so much better to do something than to keep this crisis going on. Um, so Martin, by 63, is a much more ruthless figure than he was in 56. But it's, he knows that it's a very close run thing, that he can't guarantee nonviolence. And if he can't guarantee nonviolence, then there are all these press people who will run with the story about African-American violence and that will become the story and the injustices won't get enough coverage. So he's really walking a tightrope by 64, 65. Do you think that Martin Luther King has been a victim of sort of a revisionist history in that from listening to your talk, you yeah. know, previously, um, Martin Luther has been portrayed to the common man uh, in terms of non-violence, it's, it's sort of a black and white situation mm -hmm. in terms of non-violence. And, and your talk um, almost shows that actually it, it, was a, it wasn't so straightforward in terms of the definition of non-violence and the tactics applied. So, so do you think that, you know, in many ways his history has been revised um, for some political end? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another thing I'll be talking about next week is that actually if you think about 
the way King is memorialized. Um, there are ways in which he's made very safe for America today, very safe for indeed the balance of the new world order, the new liberal order, where actually protest isn't the way you go about things. You know, it's just the market will decide. Um, so he has become a much less understood figure. Though I think, even at this point, there were elements of distortion coming in, which he, in a sense, had to go along with. That, given that he knew that there were forces within government that were trying to clamp him down as well, there was a sense in which the more often he reached out to whites and said that this was a moral crusade and that um, they should believe in Christian brotherhood, he genuinely believed that, but he was also very good public relations in terms of what was difficult for his adversaries to strike down. They kept trying to say that he was a communist, an agent of the Communist Party, taking orders from a Communist Party member called Stanley Leveson. So he had to play a very intricate game. Um, but I think what we've lost is the radicalism of Martin Luther King and indeed the radicalism of nonviolence. I think in a world in which you see brutality almost celebrated in various places, you know. Jihadism is partly a result of the failure of nonviolence to offer a way of dealing with conflict. We know there are injustices in the world, we know there is conflict. If you don't embrace nonviolent direct action, then the alternative is armed struggle. And armed struggle as a brutalizing method can create the kinds of things that we're seeing on the TV screens. So Martin Luther King's message has been lost at a cost, and it does provide an alternative if you're prepared for the hard work that it involves, for the very, very difficult things that it involves. But as well as saying that it's been revised, and, and perhaps that's misleading current movements. So if you look at, for example, the Occupy movement, mm. and, and prior to that there was a Stop the War movement, you know, sophisticated in many ways, but primarily sort of, you know, uh, demonstrations and, and, and very passive, you could argue. Um, well, you know, maybe I'm, being, I'm simplifying what their actions. Yeah. But, but, but nonetheless, you could say that those two examples failed. You know, we, we still went to war and, and the Occupy movement fizzled out or has fizzled out. You know, that's so. right. I mean, the reality is that no one protest ever wins the, wins the, the war. And so, to some extent, Occupy did provoke some degree of unease within the system whilst it was going on. And it was really only when it lacked, when it failed to capture the public imagination and draw more support that it began to falter. So the public relations side of these protest campaigns is very, very important. Um, I think uh, the Stop the War campaign, um, I think anti-war movements are always faced with the dilemma once the troops are sent of what, and this was true of the Vietnam War, what do you do about the people who are already there, whose families want them to come back safely? You're always going to be accused of not supporting the troops, not being patriotic, not being disloyal, aiding the enemy. So there's a whole set of things that frustrate anti-war movements once the troops are sent, the stronger moment to make the protest is before the troops are sent, um, and to try and, and resist them in that way. Zoe? Just I guess, adding to what Kevin just said, I, was, I really liked what you talked about because it emphasised that level of organisation that the civil rights people had. That, um, I think Occupy Wall Street definitely didn't have. They didn't have proper manifestos and their I mean, deliberately so, um, their, their events weren't planned in the way you're describing them, Marshall Washington and March being planned. Yeah. So I that also led me to wonder, I guess, how new this really was in history. You know, I studied the 19th century the slave rebellions and anti-slavery action. And certainly they were experimenting with sort of non-violent civil disobedience. Maybe not on this sort of mass scale, and maybe not calling it that and not philosophizing about it, but um, you know, uh, non-violently resisting um, 
uh, sort of anti abolitionist mobs when they were coming. You know, Garrison tried to get himself thrown in jail a lot. Um, so, I mean, it was the new thing just that it had a, it was happening in a really big way and it had a name and people were calling it this thing? Or, or was, it some, was there a new actual strategy in the 60s that hadn't existed before? I think you can't entirely get away from the fact that the 60s were the first television generation. Nonviolence wasn't just happening in a particular place and only being covered in that particular place. So Gandhi had been aware that the spectacle of nonviolence could have a, uh, a larger impact through global media in the 30s, through newsreels and radio. But the immediacy of television meant that particularly within the United States, there came a point in 63 where ordinary Americans were uncomfortable with what they were seeing on television. The problem I feel is that the stories that the media told um, became more cynical more rapidly than the movement did. And so to some extent, they got used to nonviolent campaigns. They got used to what King was trying to do and became actually more excited. It made for more exciting television if there was violence. So for them to cover a demonstration um, that was linked to, um, say, the Newark uprising became as big a story for, from just from the uh, kind of me mechanism of news carrying as covering a non-violent demonstration in Newark. So the television is initially a real plus for the non-violent movement, but that advantage is very short-lived in a way. So I'd say that was a difference for King. Um, so it's sort of the first time non-violence has been it's performed in the... Why is everyone mass performance in that way? Yeah, I think so. I think um, the, uh, the, the photographs I showed of the, of the student demonstrators uh, being attacked by... Um, by white segregationist youths. That got incredible coverage, and even some white segregationist politicians admitted that they were embarrassed by the spectacle of white youths who looked like tearaways and uneducated hooligans yeah. attacking very respectable, well-dressed, well-groomed, polite African Americans. They realized that they looked bad mm. and that African Americans looked good. So there was a moment when the media was working in their favour, but it, it didn't last very long. I think I may have worn you out, <laughs> rather than inspired you. There we go. Thank you all for coming. Um, as I've indicated, we're going to be doing this again here next Sunday, 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Four o'clock one is going to look at Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Stokely Carmichael, the man who popularizes the black power slogans, and think about actually, have we misjudged King if we just see him as somehow contrary to those two voices? Were there ways in which those voices fused and overlapped? And then at six o'clock in the evening, I'll be taking up very much your question, which is, the Martin Luther King who's remembered every King Day and who has a monument on the Mall and who has still some money coming to his family from the daily playing around the world of the I Have a Dream speech is not necessarily the, I Have, the Martin Luther King we should remember. And thank you again.